I can't move around. I know, I thought you were wanting to hear it. Oh, no, no, no. Is that cool? I did? Thank you. You can get me, you can see. Yeah, yeah. Where's your, where's your Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was in WB for 10, 11 years and five years at MCV. Yeah. <laughs> and then I was in WB. All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, what's the time? No, you're fine. You're fine. We'll figure it out. Figure it out on the fly here. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks to um, uh, Steve for all this, Steve Leslie for all his work on putting, uh, leading this and the uh, conference tomorrow and on Friday. And for all of you for uh, coming in person, I'm an in-person kind of guy. Uh, so I'm Jazz Alawalia, professor at Brown University. We'll just go ahead and get started here quickly. Our speaker will be uh, Jessica Zidniak. Zidniak, yeah, who I've known for various uh, reasons at different conferences and so on and so forth. Uh, she'll be presenting, the title's right up there. Uh, as uh, some of you know her, of course, she's uh, an Eastern Shore Virginia native. She has 25 years of experience in this space as a behavioral scientist, working in nicotine um, uh, as a behavioral scientist, as I said. Uh, she works in product development, behavioral science, consumer research, specifically in next-gen products, regulatory applications, and product innovation. She has uh, experience with the federal government, CDC, NIH, NSF, FDA, all the other acronyms that are out there. Uh, she currently, her position is as Chief Research Officer at Applied Research and Analysis Company. And um, the discussant uh, will be uh, Mohamedi Sarkaro. I guess I'll introduce in, in a few minutes. I asked Mohamedi where he got his PhD from because I couldn't remember a few seconds ago and he just stared at me blankly. And he's like probably wondering why I'm asking. I said, because I have to introduce you, Mahavani. Um, so he did reveal the information. But let's go ahead and get uh, Jessica uh, to uh, present. I'm going to click that it's being recorded, I guess. It's being recorded, right? Yeah, I'm going to say. You're okay being recorded? Okay. So let's give a warm welcome to uh, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you, Jazz. I appreciate the introduction. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I just want to, <clears throat> sorry, um, just note that I have our team members here. We have Dr. Mather and Chris. Um, so they were also assisting on uh, this study. So first, as always, start with a disclaimer. Actually, is this going to precede the slide, right? If I hit that, I can walk around. Um, so funding source, um, so ARAC was contracted um, through Accorda Regulatory Solutions. Uh, we actually have Dr. Angelico here um, at the table. Um, as the lead behavioral science research firm to conduct this study, <clears throat> the products um, are related to Lotus vaping technology. So it's going to be uh, Freenoms. And um, they have put in uh, revised applications. They have a current application um, within the FTA currently. Uh, and this actually, I think, is going to be submitted uh, soon for them to review. Um, so we are going to present select findings here. There's a whole lot of results. Uh, that came out of this study, as you're going to see. So we're going to um, really focus on the main outcomes that we know FDA is most interested in. 
And the majority of this is obviously going to be results from this study, but there are aspects here that are going to be my own individual um, and our team's uh, expert uh, opinions. So just gonna cover the typical uh, um, agenda for a study like this. We're gonna talk about why this study is important, a little, little bit of background, um, study purpose, objectives, outcomes, uh, the design, the results, and the discussion. So very standard for um, scientific presentation. And I'm not gonna spend too much time here because there's a, there a lot of slides and a lot of good data. I think we all know um, the FDA, you know, if you were there Monday and Tuesday, we know that um, they are focused on the risks and the benefits of a candidate product. Um, so when we think about the benefit, it is demonstrating that, you're, um, that smokers are going to switch to your candidate product. And that's really important um, to consider as we move through this presentation, um, because we're gonna talk about, well, to what level do we have to make sure that we're showing that the uh, smokers are switching to or reducing CPD. And we all know, um, probably in the room, we've heard various quotes here recently um, about applications being MDO'd. Um, and they're saying, you know, if application contains sufficient scientific evidence to meet the necessary public health standard, including the non-tobacco, um, we'd authorize it. But in this instance, um, I think the most recent one, um, the evidence was lacking in this case. And so we can review um, a lot of these quotations. I think we probably, everyone in this room has. Um, and then the question is, well, what is that scientific evidence that you need to demonstrate that benefit? Uh, this study is going to do that. Um, and then obviously they're also asking about the risk. Um, so we have to consider um, the likelihood and prevalence of youth and non-user use. This study does not do that. Um, so that really does focus on that benefit side of the coin. Um, this is again, were quotations from the most recent denial order um, indicating, you know, NYTS showing that used e-cigarettes um, had the second most commonly reported um, e-cigarette brand since 2021. So in this instance, you know, in, again, in my opinion, the applicant really should have shown the most reliable and robust data to demonstrate that you have that benefit because in this instance, the risk was known um, when it comes to youth use. Uh, okay, so what is reliable and what is robust? And I could talk about this for days and our team uh, talks about it all the time. Um, so depending on what part of the application uh, you're working in, that's going to, to change, right? So I'm a psychologist by training. Um, my PhD is in experimental social psychology. We have social, other social psychologists on the team. So that's our perspective. That's where we are coming from. Um, so we are focused on the social and behavioral science aspects of the application. Certainly if you're in toxicology or if you're in analytical, your reliability and robust uh, definition is going to be different than ours, okay? So that's important to keep in mind. Um, we are trained in... RCTs. We are trained as experimental psychologists. We know that reliable and robust um, means what we did. Um, so this study was very different um, than what we have known uh, to be in the scientific literature and other companies to do. Uh, this is one approach, right? This is not, we're not coming here saying this is the only thing that you should do, can do, etc. Um, but if you, again, you were at the FDA the past two days, you definitely heard, and I'm posting two of the slides that they actually uh, presented, and it was very timely because then we are presenting here today pretty much the exact same thing. Um, so this study is important because we plan the study differently, uh, we design the study differently, and we analyze the study differently than, again, what we know to have been the case so far in the industry when it comes to PMTAs, MRTPAs, et cetera. Um, so we, and again, if you were there yesterday, you're, this is going to sound like the exact same thing. Um, so we had a priori power and sample size calculation. So we considered 80% um, power. We consider our effect size. We did that a priori in advance of conducting the study. We did a priori hypotheses um, where we were doing NHST testing. So null hypothesis statistical testing. So we had um, those p-values set. Um, also, you know, our team, I, I spent uh, eight years, seven years, eight years um, in a large nicotine tobacco firm uh, company, and a lot of my colleagues are here. Um, and so I have tried really with our behavioral scientists to bring that knowledge to them because it's really important um, when you're designing and conducting a study that you understand um, the consumer, you understand their journey um, from switching off of cigarettes to a potentially um, into a candidate product. Um, so we consider that in our design. Um, I know yesterday they, they talked about RCTs versus longitudinal and actually studies. Again, in my opinion, both are needed, <clears throat> especially when you're talking about flavors. 
Um, one brings very strong internal validity. One brings more external validity when it comes to your results. So what we did in this study is really took a hybrid approach. I would say 95% of the study design is going to be RCT. It is an experimental designed study, but we have that five to 10% where we wanted to make sure we also were able to generalize and extend our results beyond the study. And I actually asked this question yesterday, which was great. RCTs are wonderful. And, and I would you know, say we need every single applicant would need to do them. But at the same time, we have to make sure that a, that a smoker who switches in our study um, continues that cessation and switching outside the study. Um, so very important. We really try and consider the, the consumer's real journey throughout uh, cessation and switching. And as we know, it's very dynamic, it's very complex, and it takes a lot of efforts for someone um, who's a smoker to switch and get off of combustibles. Uh, design was different. Um, we are currently in the process of writing up two publications, um, and so from, from this uh, from this study, and so we were very much focused on making sure we can uh, produce you know our findings into high level academic journals so that it's peer reviewed and um, stands as good science. Uh, the design was different because we randomly assigned the participants, as we're going to see. And we considered, as I mentioned, the internal external validity, and then our analysis. Certainly, descriptive statistics are very important. Percentages, sure, but inferential statistics are uh, th that makes that reliable and robust data. You want to be able to generalize your findings, and so inferential statistics do that. And so we did a combined approach there. So, uh, study purpose, objectives, and outcomes. I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. I think the slides are going to be posted. So um, you can go back and review. So we, the main purpose was <clears throat> to provide evidence that the Freenoms products can adequately protect um, public health by switching adult smokers off of combustible cigarettes to the candidate products. Um, and then more um, specifically, the flavored candidate e-liquids are going to switch combustible smokers off of them at a higher rate than the tobacco tasting. Those were our, that was our purpose. Objective, same thing. Primary outcomes, we had three major ones um, typical to a study like this. So it's going to be cessation, um, you know, smoking combustible cigarettes the past 30 days, not at all, um, as well as yesterday. Um, this is an important distinction between the literature, and I've been trying to fight for this for several years, and a lot of clients are getting on board now. Um, in the social sciences, it's very robust finding that your retrospective memory is extremely inaccurate. Right, so that's why also the FDA has said re retrospective studies where you go back and ask people why they switch, what flavors have they used. Um, th that's not the reliable robustness that they're looking for because it's inaccurate, right? And that's a well-founded uh, finding. And so asking someone their past 30 days versus yesterday, you're going to have an entirely different perspective and it's gonna be more accurate because if you can sit here today, most likely you remembered what you did yesterday much more than you did the past 30 days. Um, so we incorporated that. We were also uh, uh, interested in cigarettes per day and that reduction, um, and then switching off of combustible cigarettes to the candidate products. Uh, as I mentioned, the study hypotheses, um, we set a priori, which are really testing as a null hypothesis. And so in this case, we said, hey, there's gonna be no differences between the conditions. Um, specifically, there's gonna be no condition in quitting and cessation, and there's gonna be no differences in the reduction of CPD. Obviously, you set it up to where um, that's what you're testing statistically, but your alternative hypothesis is really the narrative and the story that you're trying to tell. And so in this instance, we were looking for participants in the flavor condition to reduce their CPD significantly more than those in the tobacco tasting and um, to quit and switch at higher rates. So we had a between subjects randomized experimental design. Um, as you mentioned, probably combined, we have probably over 50 years of us here on our team uh, conducting this type of research. Main story here is we had our sample, they were screened, whether or not they met the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, you can see, there we go. Um, they were randomly assigned uh, to one of two conditions, right? So they were either assigned to the, I'm assuming that's a thing, but it's not, um, the flavored condition, and you can see the five different flavors they had access to, or they were randomly assigned to the tobacco tasting condition. Um, we actually conducted in-person product training, which was extremely helpful, and the FDA even noted this yesterday, um, this acclimation period, making sure a consumer, a smoker, walks out of there with the internal locus of control to know, I have the power, I have the ability, and I have the knowledge to use this product and get off of my combustible cigarettes is very important. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, they were randomly assigned. They, took, um, they were able to select four flavors, 
Um, they were then sent home after the training and had four weeks of use at home. They came back month one, conducted um, or completed a survey that measured all of our outcome variables we just talked about. They were able to get more product and that repeated for three months. Just a quick note before we get into the results. We, uh, my statistical analyst, uh, Dr. Mather is here. Um, and I should also say that a priori sample size calculation, I know I didn't report that, but we, we did do that to make sure we had sufficient sample to conduct our analyses. The first step um, was excluding outlier scores with impossible responses, um, just doing the typical data screening that everyone does um, before conducting your analysis. And obviously we have all, all data files being sent to the FDA. Okay, so if we look at our sample, <clears throat> Um, right there in the middle of the randomized, we had 451 people randomized into one of two conditions. So you can see the flavor condition was a sample size of 230, tobacco tasting was 221. I think we needed 110 in order to conduct our um, inferential statistics and Bobby's shaking his head. <clears throat> then you can see month one, month two, month three breakout of sample size. You can see, um, it's, I call it attrition. It's not really attrition in this instance because attrition typically is they just never come back. In this instance, they could not miss two consecutive site visits or um, yeah, site visits. So someone could have not come at month one, um, but they came back at month two and month three. They could have not come at month two, but they were in at month one, month three. So they were considered in the sample size there. You see at the end of the study, we had 181 in our flavored products and 157 in our tobacco tasting, which is really important because um, if that, those numbers had been in, like really different, that would have been a big problem to the internal validity of the study. But really what this shows, um, and I think when we looked at it statistically, it was um, failure to return at the same rate between both conditions. Um, so we can um, make that more equivalent versus saying something was going on in one condition and not the other. And that is, did not happen, so that was fortunate. Okay, here what we see, <clears throat> Descriptive results, again, you're gonna have these slides. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna like speed through this. The moral of the story here is <clears throat> um, what we wanted to look at was kind of like a behavioral funnel. So people could come into the study and choose a flavor, but it doesn't mean they're going to go home and try that flavor, right? If they try that flavor, it doesn't mean they're gonna go home and use that flav flavor frequently. They use that flavor frequently, most likely this is the case, but uh, it doesn't necessarily mean they enjoy and like it, right? Although they should. Um, so this just shows you over time, the sample and the flavor condition, um, the number of people who chose the flavor, tried it, used it and liked it. And so we have our different flavor breakouts there. And then what this is showing, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, cigarettes per day between the conditions over time. And I love this slide. Thank you, Chris. Um, beautiful slide because it really shows first uh, from an experimental perspective, our conditions really started pretty much at the same uh, CPD, which is really good. And that's an underlying assumption of an experimental design because <clears throat> you are controlling for your confound variables. It's very, very important. This design is the only design that allows you to say the variable that's being manipulated is directly causing your outcomes. Otherwise, you cannot say that. Um, and so when you randomly assign people to conditions, what you're doing is you're saying, you have a random chance of being here or there. And with that, you typically then assume that your samples are going to be pretty similar. Um, and we, when we looked at that, they were. And so that's actually showing that at baseline to be the case. Um, interesting, at, at month one, we see an uptick um, a little bit, not significant in the cigarettes per day. But what you then see is over time, month two, month three, um, there is a um, greater reduction in cigarettes per day among the participants who were in the flavors, and that's the blue line, compared to those that were in the tobacco tasting condition. And again, this is descriptive, right? So descriptive means you're describing your results. Um, reliable and robust data really falls on inferential statistics, where you can infer um, and you can generalize your results. Um, we're not there yet though. So descriptive results, another way to say this is basically the flavors nearly doubled as effective at reducing CPD. So in the participants in the flavored group um, went from 11.7 cigarettes per day to 6.88, which is a 41% reduction. Whereas those in the tobacco group started at 12.51 CPD and reduced to 9.54, which is a 23% or 24% reduction. 
um, amazing. Okay, so we talked about the hypotheses, right? So the first one was saying there's going to be no differences between in CPD between the conditions. So we conducted a multivariate analysis of covariance. Um, I won't bore you with that, but we could talk for hours about that. What, you, what that allows you to do is control for variables that are potentially um, going to impact your results. It is the most powerful test when you have a study like this and is designed as such. This just gives you an overview. The covariates, our independent variable, which was condition, our dependent variable I've already mentioned. And then just to take, again, um, a plug at this reliability, uh, reliable and robust. Um, it's really important when you, before conducting your inferential statistics to test for your assumptions. So a lot of people will just run an ANOVA, run a T-test, or run a, run a MANCOVA. Um, And here are the inferential statistics, and this is what people rest their entire dissertation on, just one single slide, which is kind of crazy. Um, so when we look at past 30 day CPD on the left-hand side, and then we're gonna look at yesterday CPD on the right-hand side, um, this is the Mancova to demonstrate whether there's a significant effect of flavor, which was our manipulated variable on CPD compared to just having the tobacco tasting e-liquids. You see a marginally significant effect. And I say that because it's at a uh, point, I wish I had a clicker, point, point zero seven three. Um, that's gonna be for past 30 day. And then when we look at yesterday CPD, again, which is the more accurate from a psychological and a cognitive perspective, we actually see statistical significance at P equals 0 0.047 and we want it to be less than 0 0.05. Um, and so what that means is, Participants in the flavor condition had um, increased or had lower, how do I say this, smoked fewer cigarettes per day statistically than those in the tobacco tasting condition yesterday. And we would even say the past 30 days. The reason for that is, and again, this will be in the publications that come out as well as applications, the FDA, which is we actually saw this finding consistently across almost all of our analyses. When we did this specific analysis, whether the outcome variable, we saw this marginal significant effect for past 30 day, but a significant effect for yesterday. Um, and so this is important, even though it's not less than 0.05, when we see findings like that, that are replicated over and over and over again, we know something exists, especially then when you compare it to some of the other statistical tests that had p-values of like 0.4 and 0.5, which you know, there's certainly not anything going on there. Okay, the second hypothesis was quitting rates and cessation. So we said, again, no hypothesis, there's not gonna be any differences. <clears throat> when we look at, um, we had 33 people quit smoking uh, past 30 day in our flavor group. And we had 21 people quit smoking past 30 day in our tobacco group. So if you take that to the sample size of everyone who participated in the entire study, you're at an 18 point quit rate for flavor and a 13 quit rate percent quit rate if you're in tobacco. If you take a sample size where your denominator is everyone that was in the study, right? So we put people back in who did not come back in at month one, month two, and month three. Um, and we, we label them as smokers, right? And when we do that, we still see a 5% difference between the flavored condition and the tobacco group. Um, so first, you know, we're seeing statistically significant effects and differences in reduction of CPD between flavor and tobacco. Um, the next step is going to be obviously after the reduction, you want them to quit. Okay. So now we see their quit rate. Um, we also have that information for yesterday and the pretty thing that you're probably looking for, hopefully looking for is that zero. Um, and so you can see, um, yesterday, how many cigarettes did you smoke in the flavored group? You, we had 40 some in the tobacco group. We had like 26. So that again was almost double. Then we are, we're incorporating a lot of really great survey measures in our studies. I think it's really important to go a little bit beyond um, what's right there, what right out in the literature right now, and actually look at it from the perspective of the individual. So we actually asked them, what did you think you did? Which is really kind of cool. So they had to self-reflect. And so we said, if you reduce the number of cigarettes you've smoked or quit, you know, how, how do you feel about it? 
you know, tell, say yes. If not, that's okay. Please say no. And so they're actually reflecting not quantitatively because that's not how people really think about it. It's actually how you think and feel about yourself and how you view yourself. And so when we do that, I think it's amazing that um, you see the difference in people who said, yeah, I have over the course of the study reduced my cigarettes per day or have quit in the flavor versus the tobacco group. So then we also looked at um, switchers, right? So um, we identified participants who um, quit and switched to the candidate products. And what we were looking for here is, so if you've quit, that's great, but like why and how did you quit, right? So we wanted to then say, well, if you quit, are you using more or less of the candidate liquid products? And so what we then found is the quitters in the flavor condition which are gonna be your red bars, no, uh, green bars. Um, they use the candidate liquid products on more days per month and more frequently per day. Um, and I think that is parallel a little bit to what one of the first speakers was talking about, which is the e-liquid use. And so when we think about like abuse liability, is that good, is that bad if they're using more products? And it might be perceived as being bad, but in this case, actually when they're using more of the products, the e-liquids, they're actually doing it because they've quit smoking, which is amazing. Um, okay, so then we looked at, of those quitters, what flavors were they using like more frequently over the course of the study? Um, I think this is beneficial to say first, um, you know, as the portfolio of products, I think as we heard yesterday at FDA, that's important, right? They had the choice. But then also when you look at the individual candidate product, and we know the FDA is interested in the individual candidate product. So we also looked at those analyses because for two, for three of the five, we had uh, sufficient sample size to be able to conduct those analysis. And what you look at here is uh, the peach, raspberry, and citrus jackfruit really jumped to the top over the course of the three months. And they seem to be most beneficial um, at allowing people to uh, quit and then stay quit, uh, quitting um, combustibles. Uh, we also typically, with our clients, always um, propose a mixed methods design, so a quantitative and qualitative aspect. So numbers are great. That is that reliability, the reliable and robust data, but it only tells you the what, right? It only gives you the, the what you see. It doesn't give you the why. So we like to incorporate a lot of open-ended questions um, or focus groups into studies like this. And when we did that, we asked them at end of month three, um, like, why do you think you quit? Why do you think you switched? Um, why did you like the flavors that you liked? Um, top reasons for uh, quitting and cutting back. Um, so we threw that into in vivo analysis, which is recommended by the FDA when you use qualitative research. And what it does is it takes um, the terminology that's in, you know, your interviews or your open-ended questions, and it gives you the most frequently stated uh, reasons or themes is what we call them. And the two that rose to the top out of the entire um, tobacco tasting and flavor condition was um, I switched or cut back because of nicotine satisfaction and the flavor. Um, you can also look at other things that they mentioned, like the social factors, the e-liquid e and um, candidate products, they reduced my nicotine cravings. Um, it was convenient, ease of use, and made me feel healthier. I felt better. And this is even with reductions in cigarettes per day. People were reporting how much better they felt. So with every, uh, every scientific study, you're gonna have limitations. Um, I do think one of the limitations here um, is the length of study. Um, I'm a firm believer in anybody who's worked with me. I typically always propose a, a base six month. Um, and I know that behavior can stabilize over a shorter period of time. That's in the literature. But if you look at the results here, um, with continued, and actually Chris on our team was working on this simulation, which is if we assumed the reduction in CPD continued for another three months, what would we see in the percentage of people who would have quit and, and um, switched? Um, and that's a pretty significant um, you know, increase over time. And so with longer periods of time, you're going to get greater stability. Yes, behavior change can happen in um, you know, seven weeks, six weeks, um, but is it sustainable? And I don't know how many of you all have been on a diet or done whatever. Um, I know I have, and I typically revert back. Um, so I, I understand why the FDA wants longitudinal long-term data, uh, because the behavior does not stabilize for long periods of time, um, beyond that, you know, six to eight weeks. 
Um, so I would always recommend that six month minimum. I would even recommend six months later to do a follow up to make sure again that you've got that internal validity, but is it actually carrying over to their life outside um, of the experiment? And I've actually talked to Todd Cecil about this quite frequently. Uh, does the, the design was randomized. I, I love it. Um, but he's always like, but you guys, it's so hard for you guys to do random sampling of your population. Yeah, it is. Um, it's really, really expensive. Um, and I would say in this industry, it's just going to be very difficult to find, um, you know, the specific targeted smokers who haven't used e-vapor products or haven't used um, whatever your candidate product is. Um, but the randomization in the design inherently um, accounts a lot for being able to contribute your findings to, you know, other things beyond what you're manipulating in your experiment. And then I think a limitation too, they're given, you know, the products as an incentive to participate, but how do you do that when you don't have products on the market? You have to, right? I mean, you have to find a way, or I don't think you can find a way around that. So in summary and next steps, um, uh, the flavored e-liquids here led to a statistically significant reduction in cigarettes per day um, compared to the tobacco tasting, and it was nearly double as effective in um, reducing their CPD. The smoking cessation increased over time, and that's where I go back to that longer period of time for the study, which would be, again, six months. Um, again, could be implications for the length of your switching studies when you see um, the increase over time of switching and then whether or not that's sustainable. Um, a, we are really adamant on this. You know, the FDA talked about longitudinal studies and actual use studies versus RCTs. I think both are needed. Um, so the combined basic applied experimental research approach should be considered and used by um, anyone wanting to get a product on the market. Um, so the basic is your laboratory research, right? The applied research is going to be more your actual use, um, your longitudinal cohort studies. Um, both are needed uh, because, again, the internal and external validity is what they're FDA is looking for when it comes to reliable and robust data. And so one of those is going to be better at the internal validity and one's going to be threatening the internal validity. So that's, I think, why they're um, proposing both. Um, we also found, let's see, the flavors and the availability and choice of the flavors when we look at it qualitatively and open-ended. That's the reason why people cut back on their cigarettes and that's the reason why people switched. Um, very powerful narrative and story the FDA should be considering. And then finally, what reliability and robustness means, it really falls back on replicability. And basic psychology focuses, um, I can never say the first word, El El sorry, correlation effect, I can never say it. Um, that is basic psychology, that 101, where we learned that if you can replicate a finding, that means your finding is reliable and robust. And so the fact that in our analyses, um, we found the same thing over and over and over again speaks to um, that reliable and robust um, aspect of the study. And so before I turn it over, I wanna say thank you to my team, Dr. Mather, Chris, um, Allison Shoemate, and then Dr. Angelico and Tom, um, wonderful client and project team. So thank you all so much for your attention. Handing it over to you, Jess. All right. Uh, thank you, Jessica, for that wonderful presentation. So we'll uh, move on to uh, Dr. Mohamedi Sarkar, who will be uh, a discussant. Uh, uh, Dr. Sarkar got his PhD, we think, uh, from <laughs> Virginia Commonwealth University at MCV, and was on fact. He was actually used to work on the dark side in the academy uh, at West Virginia University for 10 years, and then about six years at um, uh, VCU. And then he had a sabbatical uh, actually at Altria and he got bit by the bug, I guess, uh, and has been working on harm reduction ever since for X number of years. Um, so uh, look forward to hearing uh, your comments. Dr. Sarkar, welcome. Thank you, Jess, for the kind introduction and thank you, Fidley and the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to be a discussion, even though it was at the last minute. And the clicker is, okay. So you know, Jessica, that was a nice presentation and you brought us some interesting points and I'm gonna just embellish on some of them and hopefully we can have a robust discussion with the folks in the audience. So look, you know, if we step back and just uh, think about it, you know, why are we here? 
main reason is that you know I applaud Fidley for putting for for the symposium because the whole purpose of the symposium is to talk about methods and what are the right methods and what's the best way to conduct these assessments so that we can have a successful application. And if we step back and think about it, the people who are impacted by all these decisions are the smokers. And that's who we should always keep in mind. You know, it's, it's easier to get caught up in debates and discussions about methods and stuff and policies, but let's not forget the smokers. And this was some analysis that we had done where we found that actually about more than half the adult smokers are looking for alternatives. They are looking to switch. So let's give them the optionality of selecting the product that will meet their needs so that they can make informed decisions about their future. So let's now bring back the focus on the role of flavors in harm reduction. This was an analysis that we did of the PART data set and when we looked at dual users in wave four who had transitioned to completely switching to e-cigarettes in wave five, 80%, more than 80% were using flavors. So what this demonstrates is that flavors definitely have an important role in making the transition journey that Jessica, you talked about. Um, so, how do we thread the needle? How do we demonstrate to FDA? You know, you, you brought up about the, you know, the, the PMTA conversations that FDA had in the past couple of days. And this is a slide from one of the presentations that FDA made. And their approach to assessing this evidence is listed here. And what FDA says that, well, look, you know, applicant, if you want to get authorization for a flavored e-cigarette, you know, you can rely on two types of evidence. One's an RCT or an observational study. And they leave it up to the applicant to give the appropriate rationale and reasoning and the science and evidence to support the APPH determination. And they also say, that, well, you can also include other types of evidence. I think that there is an opportunity to draw upon all the different multiple lines of evidence to make the case of why that specific product is APPH. Um, they go on to say that, you know, they, they make the determination based on the presence or absence of evidence. Of course, you know, if the evidence is absent, then I don't know whether you can make the determination or not. Uh, but the other point that they make, which kind of ties into the fact that, you know, the focus has always been for us is, you know, adults switching. But let's not forget the other part of the equation, which is youth use of flavored products. And that's always a sensitive issue. And, and I think what's between the lines is that, you know, information regarding novel mitigating strategies. So for example, device access restrictions may become an important consideration in the overall uh, holistic overview. So, you know, I thought I'd, I'd take a moment and just have a pause in terms of what is the right way to look at it. And, and I appreciate Jessica, you said that, you know, there's, it's not either or, it really depends. And this is my point of view that, you know, when we are trying to assess the impact of a flavored ends on consumer behavior, it's important to keep in mind what's the individual preference. So I'm looking at the table around here and you see some Diet Coke, you see some water, and a jazz, you like your Diet Coke, Coke Zero over water, right? So, I mean, each one of us has their own individual preferences. And when you randomly assign a group to only a tobacco flavored group, you're not taking into consideration what their individual preferences are. And likewise, if you randomly assign them to the flavor group, you know, maybe there are some individuals who prefer the unflavored. So I think when you consider the different options, you have to keep that in mind. Of course, you know, each of these have their pros and cons, and I'm not just going to uh, list them, but to me, one of the biggest deterrent is the fact that, you know, the confounding of the inherent preferences, and that can lead to some false positives or false negatives because you know they may 
because they'll have the ability to choose from what else is out there in the market. You know, I mean, we see it with the VLNC, you know, randomly assign them to low nicotine cigarette, but compliance is always an issue because they have other products to choose from. So choice is really important. Um, this is, you know, just another snippet from a slide that FDA included in their discussion yesterday. And there were some design considerations that I think are important to uh, talk about. One is the duration of the study. How long is long? Longitudinal cohort studies, for example, you know, is it one month? Is it six months? Is it 12 months? Or is it two years? I don't know. Stabilization of use behavior, at least we have seen in pretty much all our actual use studies that if the product hits the mark, if it's satisfying, that change is gonna happen within the first week. And we've consistently seen that within first week, you reach an asymptote. Does that mean that you know, it completely captures the stabilization for the entire study population? Probably not. But in the first week, the majority of the changes that are gonna happen are gonna happen in the first week. Does that mean that we just do a one week study? No, that's not what I'm saying. But we have found that six weeks is a reasonable time frame because let's keep in mind, you know, the longer the duration, that much further away you're from developing your application and submitting to FDA. Every day, CDC says every day, 1200 people are going to have premature deaths because of smoking. The sooner we can get the application in the hands of FDA, the sooner FDA can decide on making the APPH determination, the sooner we can get it in the hands of smokers, that much better we are off. Uh, the other consideration is, I think in my mind, an important one is, you know, this construct of past seven day versus past 30 days versus what you called yesterday. Um, you know, I'm not sure whether a 24 hour abstinent is a good measure of complete switching. I think at minimum, it should be at least a seven day or a past 30 day point prevalence. I think that's the uh, robustness and reliability of your switching behavior. I think 30 day is, is definitely the gold standard, but at minimum, it's, you know, seven days, but 24 hours, I'm questioning that. Um, in in the, uh, the recommendations that FDA made, they also pointed out secondary outcomes, which and one of them was significant reduction in cigarette consumption. Now, you know, of course, you know, complete switching is the ultimate desirable outcome, but significant reduction in cigarette consumption. What is that level of cigarette reduction that's considered meaningful enough? Let's look at the science. The science clearly shows that 50% or more is the threshold. If you reduce your cigarette consumption by 50% or more, there is evidence that shows that clearly shows that you know there is measurable reduction in disease outcome and in disease risk. Anything less than 50%, I question the validity of the relevance of the public health impact of the cigarette reduction. Um, there are additional considerations that are important that are often forgotten is, you know, just this whole attrition. And, and as you pointed out, you know, people come in and out of a long study uh, just because, you know, life happens, right? Uh, they just miss certain data points. But, you know, in order to be really robust, uh, it's important to keep in mind that, you know, you need to present both sides of the coin so present the per protocol of the complete switchers, as well as those who were in the intent to treat or starting at the baseline. So your denominator, you need to adjust that denominator. And then the last point that I want to make is efficacy versus reach. So what do I mean by that? Impact is, can be measured by efficacy, which is your switch rates, times the reach, which is how broad is the population. In some instances, you may have relatively low efficacy, but if it reaches a, a large population, that's an important outcome that should be considered because let's just not focus on just does the flavored e-cigarette have a statistically significant difference compared to tobacco flavor. So that incremental difference may be small, but if that reaches a larger group, 
then that's equally meaningful, or actually more meaningful in my mind. Um, yeah, and Jessica, you presented the slide, so I just thought to point out that, you know, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a nuance, but it's an important one that when you have a statistical analysis that is done, you have to keep in mind that, you know, there is a reason why we said the alpha at 0.05, and if it's not, then it is not significant. And, you know, you can't kind of say, well, it's marginally significant. So I, I would say that we should be careful about drawing those inferences. And of course, you know, I mean, FDA has the data, so they will, you know, do their own analysis and come to their own conclusions. So I, I think it's that's always uh, an important. And in the interest of time, I'm going to move, move on. And one last piece before I, you know, open the floor for discussion is that whenever we talk about flavored e-cigarettes, we have to think about you because that is front and center in FDA's mind. And this is everybody may have seen this data. You know, the youth use of e-cigarettes was front and center and focus for everybody, including public health. And the good news is that they continue to decline, but we've not reached there, but they're going in the right direction. But look, the problem is that if you look at the NYTS data and the youth use for disposable e-cigarettes, puff bar, is the highest amongst all the different uh, products that were used. And there's some other products. And, and the point being here is that FDA has the opportunity to clean up the market. You know, there are all these illegal illicit products. We don't even know whether they've submitted any PMTs or not. What we, the way we'll be able to control youth use is have a regulated market where responsible manufacturers are taking all the steps to minimize youth excess access so that we can then focus on the adults and they get the products in their hands. And at the end of the day, you know, um, I'm gonna make a pitch for my colleague, Thad, who is gonna do a presentation. There's an elegant way to quantify, because we always hear this, you know, how much of a youth use is um, unacceptable unac beyond which, you know, we have re crossed that threshold. It's actually, Pretty straightforward, and Thad will sh share that with us. If you're going to leave early, don't leave. Come to the last presentation. So it's very, very beautiful. And there's a way to figure out, you know, what is that sweet spot where youth initiation then offsets any potential switching, um, so that you know we can get a better understanding of the balance between the two. And I, you know, before I just some closing thoughts, you know, of course when we are trying to understand uh, use behavior, we want to try to, as closely possible, mimic real world uh, conditions. And that's a challenge in a pre-market setting when you are, are working with an experimental product. Um, and I'll read Regina, while well, RCTs have a place in, in the overall lexicon, I think that, you know, observational studies are better suited when you're trying to assess uh, use behavior. And at the end of the day, you know, availability of options is really, really an important consideration when we're thinking about the morbidity and mortality from cigarette smoking. You know, let's focus on people who are unable or unwilling to quit. Let's give them the options. And I would be remiss if I don't reiterate that, you know, FDA should present clear and specific guidance on what is their expectation? I mean, you mentioned, Joe, uh, early in the morning about the opaqueness of the whole process of the PMT review. You know, let's clarify and let's some, let's figure out what the playbook is so that we can then uh, play against that playbook game. I'll end then uh, open the floor for discussion. Right, so um, great, wonderful. Let's uh, open it up to some Q and A. This is like last week. I was a moderator. Uh, last week I was a moderator at NIH, and after two questions, <laughs> there were no more questions, and we still had twenty minutes. 
And so then I said the following, I'll pay you 20 bucks to ask a question. <laughs> okay. so you said that before I said the 20 bucks. So uh, just for the record, I actually increased it up to hundred dollars. And then there were tons of, you know, uh, Dave, I think David Levy might've gone up to the mic. I don't remember who was there, but tons of people went up to the mic. Just for the record, I never paid anyone, but, <laughs> but please go ahead. Uh, does he have a mic? Yeah, if you don't mind using okay. that. Hello, Brian or Close Swedish Match. Um, thanks very much, both of you. But Jessica, I have a question for you, and I'm hoping you can help me figure out what that question is. But um, in your study design, um, every few weeks there was an option to, to change, right? And I was wondering if you could say a little more about that, right? Because that's really interesting to me where, you know, the idea that product X might work so well, product Y might work so well, but the ability to like keep it fresh and maybe get rid of sort of some boredom with a product or try something new? Like if you saw any results like that in the study? Yes, thank you, Brian. Um, absolutely, yeah. And interestingly though, it typically, gosh, I wish I could remember the results and this will be in a publication that's coming out. Um, but I wanna say by like month three, most people landed on two flavors and they would just kind of alternate back and forth. Um, but yeah, definitely, you know, they'd come in and they said that that was part of what kept them from smoking or from, you know, why they were cutting back on their cigarettes is because it wasn't the same flavor all the time. Yeah. You can collect your $20 later. I'll up it to $40 uh, for anyone <laughs> uh, to, to do this. It's a, <laughs> using contingency management, behavioral economics. Uh, I know there are questions out there. You're just being shy. There we go, Joe. Hey, I knew you'd come through. Thank you. Hi, Joe Gitchell, Penny Associates Consult for Jewel. And I really did just jump up to see, to like get some debt for you. No. So uh, this is broadly expressed, but in talking over lunch, it is really odd how the balance of this flavored product question is framed that on the downside, it's the reach as Muhammad pointed to, and on the upside, it's the efficacy question, essentially. And isn't that kind of nuts on both sides? Because what if flavored are more addictive and are more likely to get young people to sustain use? Wouldn't you, you that should be factored. And then on the other side, isn't just the appeal of having a range or different flavors you're not getting at that reach part with these sorts of study designs. So I, that's a question without a easy answer, but it seems like it's worth this laying out. I, yeah, and um, I wouldn't say it's an easy answer, but I do have an answer. So um, I would disagree a little bit because what we actually saw was, so I, I started this thinking it was the flavor choice, the choice of flavors. And it does drive, right? A reduction in CPD and quitting. But then when you actually look at the individual flavor data, there are certain flavors that would seem to be more effective at reducing the CPD and switching. And so I don't know if you guys saw, you know, recall the slide that of quitters. And there were two flavors that they were chosen a lot. They were tried a lot, but they actually weren't frequently being used and liked among those that were quitting, right? And so when it comes to reach, that was very clear that these two flavors really rose to the top and would be the two flavors maybe that are going to reach and you know be the two flavors that are more likely to be helpful um, at reducing CPD. Um, we're not gonna go as far as to say, you know, that the other two aren't needed because part of, you know, I, I feel like the argument is the consumers go on a journey when they quit smoking, right? So even though they tried and used those bottom two flavors, they those two flavors were a part of their journey to reduce and quit. So in removing them, you're you know logically not going to get the same result because you didn't engage in the same behavior to get that result, if that makes sense. So Joe, I'm not sure over there understood the question clearly because 
Because you mentioned that fla flavors are more addictive than non-flavored. Is that what you really sorry. meant? I'm, I was... <laughs> so, I, and I think you're, I think if I understood your point, I'm even saying, what I'm saying is a benefit that's not being measured is how many people even showed up or called to register for the trial knowing that it's flavored versus not flavored. Did that the opening of the funnel, not so much how many people make it all the way through the end. Because but so, you did not know that that's what, there was lots of like reduction in bias and, and things like that. So they got caught in and came in not knowing what they were right, getting right, into. Right. But if the risk for flavored ends is that they're relatively more appealing for non-users, young people, that's just like done. But there could be other risks that aren't being counted then. And the on the benefit side, we're not calculating the incremental group of smokers who wouldn't, people who smoke, who wouldn't have even tried if there weren't access to non-tobacco flavors. So it just seems it. like we're doing this contrived structure that is falls short on both sides. I mean, it's not the only thing I'm disappointed in. <laughs> something just struck. Well, look, life is full of uh, managing expectations and compromises, right? <laughs> um, but you know, your point is well taken because at the end of the day, you know, I'm hoping that FDA looks at the totality of the science and evidence from every viewpoint, not just focusing on one aspect of the application. Um, but you know, if you kind of put it all together, the toxicity, the you know, the reductions in HPHCs, um, the stability, as well as the individual health risks. You know, um, look at the ingredients, the flavors, and the you know, and the end of the day, the population impact. If you add it all together in the equation, one part of that equation, of course, for the population impact is appeal to youth and non-users, and the other side of the equation is appeal to current users so that they will switch. And which is why I just would make the pitch for my colleagues presentation. I think there is, it's not the only way, but it's definitely a, one elegant way of trying to quantify what is the right balance of, you know, okay, we admit it. I mean, you mentioned this, Steve, that it won't be zero for kids, right? But there will be some level of uptake. And what is that level of uptake and what, how the trends are moving so that we can then figure out when it will it offset the incremental increase in public health that we see with the switching. And when does that tipping happen where any further use of youth use is unacceptable? I'm not saying that you know we should just sit by on the sideline and watch uh, these trends going up, but as the trends are growing, we have to keep an eye on what the switching rates are and figure out you know, whether we are missing out on the public health benefit. And another point is that, you know, regarding youth access, I mean, we've seen this clearly that access restriction is going to be the way forward to further thwart any potential uptake by kids. You know, all the raising the minimum age from 18 to 21 is a good thing. You know, advanced technologies for age verification is yet another layer, but the ultimate kind of firewall is going to be access restriction. Yeah. Just a quick study design thing. So, right, I mean, uh, just a comment on sort of, you know, the, what we teach our students is simply there's case study, case series, uh, retrospective, uh, case control, prospective cohort, and RCT. If you want to show efficacy, you do RCT. Prospective co. <laughs> oh <my laughs> Even Siri wants to try that. that RCT is not oh, yeah. the best. Business. It's got prospective versus retrospective. Yeah. You gotta love technology. So RCTs or for efficacy, prospective cohorts do not tell you anything about efficacy other than sort of yeah. hypothesis generating. Although, as you pointed right. out, Mommy, that prospective cohort studies are very good for actual use behavior to, mm -hmm. to look at, like Jewel does these sort of things. I think you're presenting on it, Nicholas. Um, so I think that's important to remember. Just two things that we clearly need a lot more work in this space. Uh, it's not published yet. 
So I won't say who's doing this work, but there's some data that's going to come out to show that flavors matter actually in an RCT. So it's a simple, elegant, simply design, actually sim sim similar to Jessica's. You randomize people to tobacco only flavor versus a choice of flavors. It's very important to have that choicing. And there's some work that's going to show that, in fact, the outcome variable, whether it's full, cessation, full switching, cessation, whatever word you want to use, or uh, cigarettes per day, 50% reduction is beneficial. We're in the midst of a very large clinical trial funded by NIH. Uh, actually, we meaning my former postdoc who's now a full professor at Kansas, Nikki Nolan. Uh, we are taking 800 menthol smokers and randomizing them to menthol cigarettes, sorry, menthol e-cigarettes versus uh, tobacco flavored, um, tobacco e-cigarettes, whatever they're called. Those two choices. Now they're clearly, problems with this design, but there are real benefits to this design. I would argue that FDA really wants this. They're very interested in this study, obviously. But I'm going to give you a little warning. I actually think we actually uh, wrote the grant as a non-inferiority trial, which means that there's sort of simply put no difference. I actually think the outcome variable, in fact, may be no different, which is going to hurt the menthol argument that you need menthol e-cigarettes. But do not conclude so fast. What he said he is actually a smart guy, by the way. I want you to know that. What he said is profoundly important, and this is profoundly important. Um, efficacy times reach equals effectiveness. So the RCT we're doing is only answering the efficacy question, which in fact shows that maybe it doesn't matter for menthol smokers to sort of use one or the other. But the reach issue is that menthol smokers may not gravitate to a uh, tobacco-flavored e-cigarette. Uh, let's say, let's say, 20% do, but if there was a menthol e-cigarette market out there, 50% would do. So do your math. Right. A, a larger number by a static number is a larger number, right? That's the effectiveness. We better let another question go here. No, it's really uh, along these thoughts. Uh, Trig viewing, Swedish match. So, so it's a design question. So we consider tobacco and flavors, but tobacco is a flavor. Right. Yeah. So people chose tobacco. Some people chose tobacco. If you randomize them to free choice without tobacco, they are not allowed to choose tobacco. So both in, in your design and in your design, were you considering having tobacco as part of that choice yeah. court? Yeah, we absolutely did. Um, and there's some other work that we're doing that yeah does exactly what you just said. Mm -hmm. That, and, and that's that's the fundamental issue that I have, that you know, you're taking away the component of preference. And if there was some way to address that confounder, otherwise, you know, the, the results that you get, well, academically, it may be a good design as, you know, an RCT being the gold standard, but it's not relevant. So, so hold on, let me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in there. So here's, here's the foundation of it all, in my opinion, which is a, observational long-term cohort study is going to have so many other variables that are going to contribute to why someone reduces cigarettes or switches above and beyond the fact that they are using flavors or not. And so both are needed, absolutely. But to determine that the only driving factor as to why you get the results you get is through an RCT, a randomized between subjects design, because the only thing that you are manipulating or adjusting is one variable, right? That's, that's the beauty of it. So you have so many potential confounds when you go out into the real world. It's needed, absolutely. And you're going to get the reach and you're going to get the measured, measured um, variables, but you cannot say the reason for a potential difference if you find it is because of they were using flavors or not. All right, let's, uh, oh, sorry, here, sorry, the Vader van. Yeah, I see you trying to skip me, Jess. So, uh, Mohammed, you brought up uh, device access restrictions earlier. And um, I have a, I think, not unfounded fear that the day FDA issues an MGO for a product with device access restrictions, they will follow the very next day with a round of rescinding MGOs for products that don't have them. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, the, my concern around that is that 
device access restrictions are not just restrictions for youth. They are also serve as a barrier to use for you know, a variety of other reasons uh, will affect some group of people more than others. Um, you know, I think we all know people who have trouble just unlocking their phone, <laughs> you know, um, and, and that is aside from people whose phone batteries die and then they can't use their product or, you know, what have you. Um, so uh, are, are folks contemplating doing studies to evaluate the, this same type of thing for products with and without those access restrictions? Um, because if you completely erase the added benefit with the, with the barrier, um, where, where are you getting with that? No, you're absolutely right. You know, device access rest restriction can work both ways for kids and for adults. And particularly if you have seen data amongst older adults, you know, they have very few of them are switching from cigarettes to e-cigarettes. You know, the cigarette prevalence is pretty flat. So that's an important consideration. And as we gather more learnings, we'll have to do some usability testing to determine uh, both amongst kids that they don't have access, but for adults from all age cohort to make sure that it does not become a barrier. I agree with you totally. There was another question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the academy, is, as far as I know, is not doing studies like that. Uh, I don't know if Jewel is doing studies about that per se, contrasting restriction versus not like down tomorrow. <laughs> Silence. And uh, I don't know, like, uh, Enjoy is, you're not doing studies. Yeah, yeah, but you're not doing studies contrasting restrictions versus not. It's no. so esoteric. I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't think anyone's going to do that kind of study. I think while it may be important. I think what would make more important. sense is to do the usability in the two the audiences the intended and unintended. But yeah, I know you got a question right there, right there. Right there. Um, so first of all, yeah, I mean, we, we told everybody we got a locked device. Um, I don't think it's an enormous shock that, you know, as you pointed out, consumers don't love it to death because it's a real pain in the butt. I mean, this common sense would have told you that, but studies also tell us that. So, you know, suspicion confirmed. Um, but that's not my question. So <laughs> I'm, my colleague, Nick Goldenson over there is going to present um, data that, that uh, if, if I have this right, and I'm sure you can correct me if I don't, shows that, that menthol products have a 10 percentage point higher switch rate than our tobacco product. Um, I guess when I when I hear these, you know, very interesting and frankly a little confusing because I'm not a statistical person, conversations about RCTs and methodology, I'm like, wait, 10 percentage points difference? I mean, are there do we really need more data than to say, yeah, that seems like an outsized benefit? And you know, what's I and I, it's an honest question. You know, that's that's our contention. There's your outsized benefit. That's a pretty big one. And Michael, was that an RCT or was it a so it's a longitudinal study. Cool. It's not an RCT. You know, we didn't do an RCT. <laughs> no, it, it's a real question. Is is yeah. was that to any one of us? Up? Ten percentage points. Do I need to do an RCT, or are we good? We call Brian and ask. I think the FDA was. Yeah. Uh, he's signing off all this. I mean, um, my gut instinct is that the F, I, I, what do I know about the FDA? I suspect that they want an RCT. I, I mean, I don't think that's rocket science because they issued market denial order all the time with prospective data and stuff like that. So, you know, um, it, I think it's, it's a be, flawed premise. Sorry to interrupt you, Jess. Yeah, I mean, it I may mean, be. the FDA is mine if RCT is the only way to get a flavored product authorized. I mean, the data that Michael's talking about, how much more compelling can it get? They're confounders with There's a prospective confound court study. Yeah. I mean, that and they're confounders in an RCT too. Yeah, you're controlling for it in it's, the RCT. Wait a, a cap. <laughs> <laughs> right, right? We don't, okay. No, you, There's something there, called there, the there are only so the many confounders of drugs. So one confounder you, you cannot drugs control for chemotherapy for. without an RCT? You know the answer. But this is not a drug. This is a consumer product. And one right. confounder that you did cannot control right. for an RCT is the individual preferences. You right. don't even ask for that. We, we actually That's did. We, met, we, we asked for that. If you randomize it, was that a randomized variable? No, it was not, right? No, it can't be randomized because if you're randomizing based on their preference, it's no longer randomization. But you at least have some. We, we did measure it. Covariate, you can we did, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yep, exactly. I thought your covariate model had just few covariates in there. 
Anyway. We, we have a lot of analyses. That was just within hopefully a 25 minute presentation is what was presented. We can argue all we want about <laughs> this. The bottom line is neither you it's, nor I was making the decision. Exactly. That's it's something important. called the FDA, yeah. the Center for Tobacco Rights is making the decision. So you can argue in the mirror every morning saying prospective court is all you need. But if no, 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 no. Let me get it clear. I'm so not saying, saying that's all actually, you want. I thought I was agreeing with you. I don't want to show. Uh, is that, I'm not sure I have anymore. I think I'm the outlier here. It's a compendium of data, prospective court with RCT. Absolutely. With qualitative and for, research put together in a package. That's how science is done. Yeah. It's not done by saying, I have a prospective court study of 5,000 people taking Juul, and this is what I conclude, this is what I found, approve my product. That's not how it works in science or FDA or anywhere. That's mm -hmm. not how it works. It's a, it's a putting the package together. Mm -hmm. Oh, I appreciate both of your perspectives and thank you so much for <laughs> all of this. We are well, done. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> well, this. <laughs> well, of course, thank you to Mohammed, Jazz, and Jessica for that uh, great presentations and then ensuing discussion. Uh, feels like a good place to point out that uh, Director Brian King will be delivering the keynote tomorrow morning uh, at our tobacco conference. He will be taking questions if you want to ask things about what he's looking for in terms of, say, flavors and what he wants to see in terms of adult switching. That'd be a good place to ask him. Um, so we will now take a quick break in the program and begin our next session at 240.